Well, it's a great privilege and pleasure to be with you, especially just gathered from around the globe. It's amazing who all's represented just right here, simply um, in this one room. And uh, it's humbling to know just a very small part of uh, the kind of challenges and opportunities that you've had just in the past 12 months or less. Uh, it's astounding, amazing. I can't even comprehend it. I mean, I can barely comprehend just what we saw, right, in just a few minutes, much less uh, all the stories that you have, uh, that you've lived through, and now together we represent and you're talking about. And I know only a very, 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 very small part of that. So when I'm asked to uh, speak, I have no idea what to, to uh, really focus on, because how can there be one message, one talk, one anything that would actually address all of you in all your situations, and of course, all of those to whom you minister? It's, I don't know how this works. So I asked Joe, <laughs> what should I speak on? And I gave him uh, several options. And uh, he chose a real easy one, but uh, he, he put at the top of his list uh, <clears throat> a little bit about the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. And I thought, well, I don't know if the, my presentation of the topic can address all the needs, but uh, maybe the Holy Spirit himself can uh, somehow. I don't know how. Um, but uh, that's, what, that's what and who I am trusting in, and I hope uh, these words that I'll be sharing with you will be helpful to you all and those you minister to in some way. God only knows. Um, but you will be channels, hopefully, of a little bit of this to pass, you'll find useful to, to pass on. So before I jump into it, let's uh, pray together. <clears throat> Uh, gracious God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we are in awe of you and amazed at your work in the world and the fact that we get to participate in what you are doing, which is far beyond even what we are aware of uh, individually or altogether. Um, but uh, you find ways for us to be involved in what you are doing in our own lives and the lives of those around us and even and the lives of those we haven't even met, but somehow uh, you minister through us, through various mediums, through word of mouth, uh, through the internet, all kinds of ways, Lord, we're, we're amazed at the work you're doing and the great privilege it is to participate. And so now we trust that you've called us together and that you will have a word for each one of us that would not only build us up, but that would not only encourage us and enable us to worship you more deeply and profoundly, <clears throat> but also uh, a word that might uh, encourage and enable us to share with others that somehow your life and your light would shine into the lives of those around us, to those to whom you have entrusted us uh, in our various uh, ministries and beyond. And so we offer up this time uh, in your name. Amen. As I said, the doctrine of the <clears throat> Holy Spirit, we're not going to try to cover the whole thing. That would take a lot, a lot longer than uh, what we have. But certain key issues that might be useful and, and helpful um, as a kind of uh, pegs to hang things on. So we won't answer at all the, at all, all the issues or concerns, but hopefully some key ones, at least the ones I seem to think uh, are, uh, that are, have been key um, on this particular topic that I've studied for many, many, many years, but I haven't really put it together quite in this package. So we'll see how this goes. But what I'd like to read uh, just from the Gospel of John here to start us off, and you'll know this, this is the story, happens in the story of Nicodemus, and he's talking about uh, to Nicodemus, trying to explain to him, really, the work of the Spirit. And so Jesus says to him, Truly I say to you, unless you are born of water and the Spirit, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. This is chapter 3, now verse 6. That which is born of flesh is flesh, that which is born of spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born anew or from above. 
The wind blows where it wills, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know whence it comes or whither it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Well, trying to talk about the Spirit is trying to talk about the wind. Um, how do you describe it? How do you, well, predict, <laughs> right, the wind and the waves? How do you predict its direction and what it will do? In some ways, it's beyond our words. In some ways, we could say it's kind of ridiculous that we're even going to try this. How do we really put in words and concepts and ideas uh, something about the spirit that is most like the wind that you can't actually predict its direction um, or say much about it except that it blows where it wills. <laughs> and I think that's part of our experience. The wind blows where it wills. And we didn't necessarily see it coming and we didn't, don't necessarily see exactly where it's going to go. <clears throat> but um, we're given words in Scripture to, to talk about the, the Holy Spirit. But sometimes People think the Holy Spirit gets a little bit, uh, you know, the short end of the stick, as we say, or short shrift, or doesn't get quite the emphasis um, of, uh, that it needs. But um, is that true, that we don't properly emphasize the Holy Spirit? And if so, uh, how do we uh, not give it a, a, the Spirit enough attention? But more than that, I'm going to talk about how do we correct for that, because I think there's various ways to correct for it, and some aren't as useful as others. But just to give you a, a basic overview of not only the Spirit, but the Spirit's relationship to the Father and the Son, so a little uh, review of the doctrine of God, the, the Trinity. Um, if we're going to talk about the Holy Spirit, you remember any theology is answering the who question. That's what we're trying to answer. Not so much the how or the why or the where or the when. <clears throat> we're really answering the who question because that's what biblical revelation focuses on and gives us. It tells us more about who the Holy Spirit is than especially how, like how does the wind work, you know? How does the Spirit blow? Well, we're not given a lot of how um, about the Father or the Son. How does that work? But who? So who is the Spirit? Well, the Spirit is one with the Father and one with the Son. So they're one in being. And essentially to remember is there's not three gods. The Spirit isn't a separate God that has his own mind and his own action and his own plan and his own purpose. Is that we're really talking about the Spirit is one in being with the Father and the Son. They are so... The point here is not to let our minds think about the Holy Spirit as an independent operator. That's the, the biggest problem uh, that can take place. So whatever the Spirit does, remember this Holy Spirit, wherever the Spirit is, the Father and the Son is. Because they're one in being. They're not, it's impossible to separate them. They're one in being. They coexist. They co inherit or some other words that have been used, they in-exist one another, or they mutually indwell one another, or they co-envelop one another, they mutually interpenetrate each other. Another way it's been said is, is that the whole God is present in each of the persons. The whole God is present in the Father, the whole God is present in the Son, the whole God is present uh, in the Spirit. That's all to say uh, they are one in being, even though they're distinguishable, we say, in person. So that also means that the Holy Spirit is fully and completely divine and has all the attributes that the Father and the Son do from all eternity. So the, none is subordinate or less than the other. So all that you can say of the Father, like being omniscient, or even being a creator. Uh, all these things can be said of the Spirit and can be said of the Son. Now that's a hard rule because we like to divide things up and say these things about the Father and these things about the Son. I mean, a typical way is to say the Father creates, the Son redeems, and the Spirit perfects or sanctifies. Well, that's actually inaccurate if you take that strictly speaking that they have different jobs or different hats that they wear or different 
uh, things that they accomplish by themselves. Uh, God acts as the one being that God is. So everything you can say about the Father, you can say about the Son, and you can say about the Spirit. All powerful, omniscient, they all are to be worshipped uh, together because they're one in being. So that's the most, one of the most fundamental things to hold on to and to watch that when we say other things about the Spirit or the Father and the Son, we don't start talking as if they're separate and have different hats and different purposes and are operating independently of, of uh, one another. So to hang on uh, to that, that actually prevents a lot of problems down the road if you just remember that. So they're one in being. And even in their actions, creation, redemption, or the perfection uh, of creation itself, is they all do together. They all do together. Now, the trick is, is that the way scripture talks, you can see that they're all involved uh, in these ways. The spirit was involved, remember, brooding over creation, all the way back to Genesis. But you can kind of forget that and just say the father creates. Well, how scripture seems to talk is, we can say is one of them seems to lead in these actions. So the father, we can say, is leads in creation. That's okay. As long as he's leading with the son and the spirit right along behind, working together. So as long as you don't leave the son and the, and the spirit behind, you can say the father leads in creation. And in our redemption, you can say the son leads in our redemption. You can say that, but if you think the father is absent, Jesus only does what he sees the father doing. He only says what the father is saying. So they're saying things together. They're doing things together. They're never separate because they're, well, one in being. So, but it is proper to say the son takes the lead. Only the son is incarnate and takes the lead. The son is physically on the cross, takes the lead. So we say, is this, this um, and that's perfectly okay. But if you think the father's absent or the spirit's, you know, gone on vacation and isn't around, well, no, now, now we're off. No, the spirit is there. Jesus says, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. So they're all together. But yes, you can say one leads, but don't let them fall apart just because one is leading. And the spirit, yes, perfects. But the Spirit perfects human beings with the perfection accomplished in Christ. The Spirit shares with us the holiness and the sanctification of Jesus himself in our humanity. So he doesn't give us a spiritualized perfection that's not connected with our bodily and human existence, our bodily, our mental, our human existence. No, the, the Spirit makes us to share in Jesus self-sanctification. So uh, the work of the Spirit's not separate from uh, the work of the Son, but the Spirit does lead in indwelling us now. So yes, you can talk about the ways the Spirit leads, but don't think of the Spirit then as branching off and saying, well, Father and Son, you know, good job over there, but now I've got to go do something over here that you don't have anything to do with. That's a mistake. That's an error. That would be that could only happen if God wasn't one in being and was three beings. Tritheism. So we don't want to go there. So you can distinguish between the Father, Son, and Spirit by the way they take their lead, but you don't want to separate. So distinguish, but don't separate. Okay? One in being, but a difference in per uh, person, both in terms of their being and also in terms of what they do towards creation, in creation, redemption, and consummation. And so, I mean, this is uh, a little bit technical, but uh, to think about what makes the persons distinct, it's not what they do. I mean, often how we distinguish ourselves, how do I know I'm not you and you're not me? Well, you have a different body, you're over there and I'm over here, and you do this and you live there. See, we can project and think, well, that's how we differentiate between the Father and Son and Spirit. The Father's over here, the Spirit's over there, they have different jobs. No, that's how we distinguish ourselves. The problem is God's not a creature like us, so you can't just take that idea of how we distinguish ourselves and apply it to God. 
essentially how we're given to distinguish between the Father, Son, and Spirit are is essentially their names. They have distinct names, Father, Son, and Spirit. And those names, if you'll notice, also represent relationships. The Father has a different relationship to the Son than the Son has to the Father. The Spirit has a different relationship to the Father <clears throat> than does the Son. So, well, let me pull this up. So this is tough, but if you follow it, you don't get into all kinds of tangles <laughs> and, and problems down the road. So if you have, um, well, hopefully you can see this. You have father, you have son. All right, and so there's names <laughs> that we actually have for the kinds of relationships. So the father is the one who begets. And we just use that word to talk about the kind of relationship is giving life to the son as the son, and the son is the begotten one. So we say the only begotten son. So they have a different relationship. The son doesn't beget the father. And the father doesn't, isn't begotten of the son. And a lot of what we're just indicating is they're not interchangeable. The father's not the son, the son's not the father. They have a unique relationships with each other, and we pr provide these words for them. But the words aren't adequate to the reality, but they do point in that together. The father is generating the son's being from all eternity, but there never was a time when the son was not. That's a little tricky. But they have unique relationships is the simplest way to think about it. And there's, you know, it, there's a direction from the father to the son. There's a direction to the relationship. And you can't reverse them. You can't say as the son begets the father. And that's because the son, there's always been eternally the son, always been eternally the father. And there's always been the Holy Spirit. Now the Holy Spirit, we use a special word to talk about that relationship. And you can find it. In, you find these words in the New Testament. Uh, but the Holy Spirit proceeds, and we don't actually know exactly what these means. You want to say, "Is well, how does that work? How does procession work in God?" Well, we don't actually know. It's, it's more about the kind of relationship. The Holy Spirit has a unique relationship with the Father and the Son, and it's different from the relationship of the Son to the Father. They're absolutely unique relationships. And that's what makes them distinct. That's it. They have unique relations. Each one has a different relationship with each other. Now, we don't know how to explain all that, what that means. So, but we use unique words because there's unique relations. And that's also why they have unique names. The Father is the Father, not the Son. The Son is the Son, not the Father. The Holy Spirit is the Holy Spirit of the Father and the Son. So we have unique names to indicate the unique persons, and they have unique relationships, and they're not interchangeable. So when God says his, call me by my name, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that's telling us something, that God is Father, Son, and Spirit, that the Father is the Father, the Son is the Son, the Holy Spirit is the Holy Spirit. But don't separate them. <laughs> they're one in being, but they're distinct in person. Now, another little problem we have is a lot of times we like to talk about uh, the Trinity as one and three and three and one. Well, that's not bad, but it's, usually, it's not all that helpful to talk that way. And let me tell you why. Um, because when you say one and three and three and one, it sounds like you're talking about the, the, what is three is the same thing as the thing that's one. So, for instance, you say if God is one and God is three. Are we saying is God is one in being and God is three in being? No, <laughs> we're not. But see, if you just say one and three, people can think one, in, one of something and, and three of the same thing. One being, three beings. But that's not what we're saying. That would actually be nonsense to say God is one being and three beings. <clears throat> or you could say as well, right, not being, God is one person and God is three divine persons. 
See, one and three, three and one. No, that's not what we're saying. <laughs> so the shorthand, you see, kind of confuses things as well. We're really saying is God is one in being and three in divine person. One in being, three in divine person. And you have to say, if you want to be precise, the whole thing. You can't get away with just saying one and three and three and one. You know, it kind of sounds clever and people go, well, that's kind of neat, but what does it mean? Well, it actually is nonsense. And if you think it's three beings and one being, you see, like, that doesn't make any sense. So remember, if you're going to use the shorthand one and three and three and one, it's one in being. when we talk about God, even what we mean by persons, we don't mean persons like exactly like you and I. We're images of God. God's not images of us. All right? If God was three persons like we would be, he would be three beings. <laughs> so we're not using these words, person and being, about God in exactly the same way we do about us. And in fact... Theology, the discipline of theology, is to make sure we don't talk about God as if God was a creature, just project these ideas on God and use these words about God as if God was a creature like us. So that takes a while for people to catch on, but that is why in the church what we're actually teaching people to think about God according to God's nature, not to think about God as a big human being in the sky. And uh, so... One in being, three in person um, is really what we mean by, and the Holy Spirit is one of the divine persons of God that has a unique relationship with the Father and the Son. One in being, but distinct in person. So the Spirit, we name that distinct relationship of the Spirit as proceeds from the Father and the Son. And so we don't say doesn't beget or and is, doesn't, isn't begotten. But everything else, you can say about the Father, you can say about the Son, and you can say about the Spirit, except the Father's not the Son. The Spirit's not the Son or the Father, uh, and the Spirit is proceeds but doesn't beget or isn't begotten. It actually is that simple to talk, to kind of get your language. Now, what that all means, of course, is deep and profound, but this identifies who God is. And in some ways, what does it add up to? Well, it means is God is, has his being by being a fellowship and communion of the divine persons. God is loving in his own being. The Father loves the Son. The Son loves the Father. And that's part of their being begotten and begetting. And the Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. These are all relationships of holy loving. So God is a fellowship. God is a communion. God's not just a lonely being out there from all eternity looking for someone to love. God is a fullness of holy love, a full, fullness of fellowship and communion. And we can say is the Father and Son have their fellowship and communion in the Spirit to bring it all together. So a God that's a fellowship, a God that's a communion, the God that is love in his being is very different than an individual God that can't love until there's something or other else outside of God to love. A God that is fullness and is fellowship is very different uh, in kind of who this God is. So the Christian God is a fellowship, is a communion, has his being by being in relationship. What kind of relationship? Well, begetting, being begotten, proceeding. Those are the only words we have to kind of point to this amazing reality of who God is. So, I mean, those are... Uh, kind of the essentials about remembering, if we're going to go on and talk about the Holy Spirit, usually in relationship to us, we have to remember who this Spirit is. And the Spirit first exists in relationship with the Father and the Son. That's the first thing. Not the Spirit's relationship to us or our relationship to the Spirit. That's afterwards. There was a time when nothing other than God existed and the Holy Spirit was perfectly happy being the Spirit of the Father and the Son. So the Spirit doesn't need us, all right? And there was a time when uh, the Spirit, there was no creation. So God was a fullness of fellowship in Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. 
So, yes, we want to talk about the Spirit's relationship to us, but that's a secondary matter, as we're from the Spirit's point of view. Um, he had, the Spirit, the being of the Spirit is being one with the Father and the Son. Um, okay, well, that's your basic Trinitarian Doctrine 101. <laughs> On there, there's lots of questions that, that come up. But the Spirit, who is the Spirit? It's the Spirit of the Father and the Son. That's the simplest answer. That's who the Spirit is. Um, so whenever we speak of the Father and Son, even in Scripture, of course, since God is one in being, then any time you're talking about the Father and Son, you are talking about the Spirit, whether you know it or not. Now, you might not know it. But you can't talk about the Father and Son without, as it were, including the Holy Spirit. Um, Sometimes we can be more explicit than not, but to say Father is not to exclude the Spirit. Do you see that idea? The idea is, no, because the Spirit's the Spirit of the Father. <laughs> to say the Son is to talk about this, the Spirit of the Son. And ver the other way around, if when we talk about the Holy Spirit, you can't talk about the Holy Spirit apart from the Son because the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of the Son. And the Holy Spirit's the Spirit of the Father. Otherwise, you're misrepresenting who the Spirit is because the Spirit has his being in his person by being in relationship. So we don't always spell this all out, and it's better if we do see all the connections. But to say the Father, the Spirit doesn't say, hey, what about me? Aren't you going to talk about me? <laughs> the Spirit's saying is, you're talking about, yeah, I'm the Spirit of the Father. To talk about the Father is to talk about me because I'm the Spirit of the Father. So the Spirit's not feeling left out. Don't feel sorry for the Holy Spirit <laughs> um, because they are one in being. Another way to say is they're, they're probably not, the Father, Son, and Spirit probably aren't envious and jealous of each other. Probably not, right? <laughs> so we don't want to go there. Um, now, another thing is a lot of the if we ask the how question, like how does God operate his providence over all of history and nature and everything else? Or how, is, how did Jesus become united to a human nature? Um, or how did God save us? Or how will God perfect us? Or how does God communicate his word to us? A lot of the actual how to questions about the Father and the Son are actually answered by the who answer. In other words, the answer is, how does God do this? By the Spirit. That's it. But see, we're often not satisfied. No, I want to know the mechanisms. I want to know the machinery. I want to know the chain of cause and effect. But often in Scripture, how God does stuff, if you want an answer to the a how question, the answer simply is the agency by means of the Holy Spirit. That's it. You get to know who does it, and that's the, the full extent in many cases in terms of how. That's all you get by the Spirit. You see, so Nicodemus is going on, what about this born again, born from above? And what's Jesus' answer? How does that happen? Does he tell him the mechanism? Does he tell him kind of a, a technique? Does he list, list out a bunch of rules that if you do this and that and the other, then bingo? No, he says it's like the wind, because that's how the spirit works. In other words, the answer here to the how question is the who. <laughs> it is by the spirit. And notice, you, because you can't get the wind down to the how in terms of technique or mechanism, Jesus is trying to say is don't even go there. You're trying to ask, how does the wind work so that we can predict it and control it? It's like, no, it happens by the Spirit. Because what? That's what the Spirit does. That's who the Spirit is. The Spirit's being true to who he is. So um, a lot of the, the biblical answer to the how questions that we have is actually refers us to the who, refers us to by the Holy Spirit. And then that's it. We always want more, <laughs> but a lot of times that's where we're left.
And that should be sufficient, I suppose. But sometimes it's not. But maybe we ought to stop where Scripture stops so that we don't start speculating. Um, and so, you know, well, if we get now we're going to already get into kind of all the controversies because you can start asking all kinds of questions that kind of assume God can be divided up. Like, can you have the Spirit without having the Son? Or can you have the Son without having the Spirit? Well, rather than, I mean, we have all kinds of Bible verses to work this out. But you see, if they're one in being, can you have one without the other? No, you can't. You can't have one without the other. God doesn't like split off. And the son goes off and says, see you, spirit. I hope you catch up later. God is one in being, but also God is one in action. They act and work together. So the, the, the question of some, a lot of the controversies forget some of the most fundamental things about who God is. Now, of course, if you forget about them, this is what can happen. Things can kind of start going all over the place, and then you speculate to fill them in, or you just grab random Bible verses and try to throw them together. And each group grabs their own favorite pile of Bible verses to make their point, and then another group grabs another stack of Bible verses and to make their point, and then they start throwing the Bible verses back and forth at each other, and you have a big mess. Um, but uh, the fundamental things are often uh, forgotten in this. So the Spirit and the Son are one in being and one in working. And of course, you can find this in Scripture as well. Or is it no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Spirit? Only the Holy Spirit will break into a person's pride and enable them to recognize who Jesus really is as their Lord and Savior come in the flesh as one of us and will say, my Lord and my God, uh, to Jesus. That never happens. If the Spirit never worked, no one would have ever said that and meant it, ever. Won't happen. Can't happen. People might have said, you know, mouth the sounds, you know, Jesus. <laughs> But that's not what we're talking about, is it? So, um, and many others. Like we, we could bring out the verses here, but the point is the most fundamental thing is they are one in being, and therefore they are one in act uh, as well. So we only come to the Father through the Son uh, in the Spirit. And when the Spirit comes upon us, which is the Spirit of Sonship, Paul tells us, like in Galatians and in Romans 5, what do we call out? Abba, Father. Isn't that amazing? So when the Spirit of Jesus comes upon us, we cry out, Abba, Father. Well, why is that? See, we know the answer, because God is one in being and one in action. So when the Spirit acts, He doesn't act apart from the Father and Son. actually brings it all together. It doesn't divide things up, because the reality is united. So when the Spirit works, it refers us to the Sonship, who then, as a child of God, we call it Abba Father. Well, if God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one in being, one in act, it's kind of like, what would you expect? <laughs> right? It makes sense. It adds up. Like, yeah. It all hangs together. And when Jesus says, go out and baptize them in the name, singular, and then he says, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, it's like, well, yeah. Is he going to leave one out? Baptize in the name of the Son or the Father or all that. No, since this is who God is, the name matches. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but it's the one name. So I like to say is God is the Father, Son, Holy Spirit God. As if it's one name instead of three names, because it really isn't three names. There's three persons, but we're baptized in the one name. That makes sense. If that's who God is, God acts and has his being. Um, so all our thinking really needs to be kind of contained or kind of within these boundaries and that will help us both interpret scripture properly um, and also help us see more deeply into scripture good theology doesn't take you away from scripture it helps you actually see how it comes together even more coherently it doesn't answer every question but um, so we want to uh, 
help us read scripture, interpret scripture, and bring all the pieces of scripture together. So why, uh, if the, why talk about the Holy Spirit uh, uh, at all? Well, there can be a difference in our understanding of the Father and the Son and the Spirit. Matter of fact, that's what happens in some of our churches because some churches always emphasize and talk about the Father only, pretty much. And some talk about the, the Son only. And others talk about the Spirit. But if they're talking about the one God, that triune God's still there. <laughs> that's who they're praying to. But their understanding may be fragmented. But that doesn't mean God is fragmented. But the understanding might be. And you might be aware of the workings as the, the manifestation. So as we try to grow in faith to understand the triune God, we're trying to improve our understanding so that our understanding matches the reality. And then also to grasp better the, the working, or the, I'm going to call it the manifestation, of the spirit. You can kind of recognize things when you have better understanding or recognizing the nature of the spirit and the ministry of the spirit as the spirit leads in certain ways. And others. So what we're trying to do is fix things on our side, not fix things on God's side. <laughs> so yes, we can grow. If we have misunderstandings, that's good to clear up. Um, if the spirit is uh, working and uh, it is perfectly okay to be aware of that as compared to unaware. But we're not making something real. It's not like God all of a sudden now becomes the Holy Spirit. Or the Holy Spirit uh, is tied and can't do anything until we figure the Holy Spirit out. That'd be like saying the wind is tied until we can figure out the wind. No, the Spirit's still at work, but we may not recognize it. But you know what? It's a lot more fun to recognize it. So this is a way for us to participate, to get involved, and to be in tune with the truth and reality of who God is. So if there is a lack of understanding or a lack of understanding the ministry and therefore the manifestation of the Spirit, of course, that's better to have everything up to speed than not. Um, and so that's, if you're going to, we're going to talk about the spirit. Well, that's what we're doing. We're trying to make sure our understanding matches the truth about who God is, such as the spirit has been revealed to us. Um, but, uh, so our understanding may be uh, fragmented, but God is not fragmented. Um, our understanding of the working in the ministry of the Spirit may be fragmented, but that doesn't mean the actual working in the Spirit is fragmented. We're not controlling God by our understanding. That God would be depending upon us then. Um, but we want to kind of sort this all out and let it all be as full as can be. All right, so that's a little bit, um, hopefully that's helpful to kind of put a framework around all this. So um, why in, in some circles? It depends. Well, churches tend to, tend to focus on the Father or the Son or the Spirit. Of course, if God is Father, Son, and Spirit, that's kind of silly, isn't it, to have some churches all over here and over there. Uh, we should really worship uh, the one God. But some are concerned about speaking proportionately about the Holy Spirit, or you might kind of say give the Holy Spirit equal time or equal emphasis. And why, why might that be? Well, I think there are bad reasons for there to be things disproportional or unequal um, or a, a difference. And of course, the wrong reasons to have these differences, a certain kind of inequality of, of our speech and our talk and our awareness and our focus, uh, is that, for instance, we don't care much about the Holy Spirit. Well, that would not be a good thing. <laughs> Uh, that would be a bad reason to have a disproportion. Or we don't know about the Spirit at all. Well, that would not be so good. God wants us to know who he is, Father, Son, and Spirit. So if this disproportion because of that, that's not so good. We should work on that. Or some may not want to know about the Holy Spirit or have much to do with the Holy Spirit because it's kind of spooky. Like, do you really want a spirit around that you can't control and you can't identify and you can't nail down? 
and you can't make a part of your program and lock in that's like the wind, maybe even a typhoon. Who wants that? So some people, yes, well, that's not the best reason not to have an interest uh, in the Holy Spirit, partly because that shows a little bit of ignorance about the nature of the power and working of the Holy Spirit. Um, so the Holy Spirit isn't like a, a ghost or something to be fearful of in that sense that it will do us harm. Uh, you could think the Spirit is now irrelevant to our current situation. In some ways that was back in those days. Um, well, that would be another reason I think that it's not so great to put no emphasis um, on the Spirit or have it be disproportional. And it could be just misunderstanding the nature of the work of the Spirit and the connection to the, the, the Spirit's connection to the Father and the Son. That might be a reason that there's a disproportion or a, a difference of emphasis or perhaps even a neglect. Um, and there, may, there can very well be other reasons for the disproportion. But I think there are actually legitimate reasons where there'll be a certain kinds of dispro uh, disproportion or inequality that has to do with the nature and character of the Spirit itself. Um, and that may be the reason why we have less to say by comparison, less to say, uh, and might not be able to emphasize in the same way as the Father and the Son is because the nature of the Spirit and the nature of the Spirit's relationship to the Father and the Son. So here's some good reasons why I think we're not, the Spirit's not going to get as or equal time in every way we can think of. Um, in terms of our explanation and our focus and our concentration and all that is, first of all, there's just less biblical information about the Holy Spirit. That's just the case. You know, you have the Gospels. The Spirit is there by all means. But you have a lot more talk about Jesus all throughout the Gospels right there. Now the same goes for Paul and the epistles. You just have a lot more. And if you want to talk about kind of God the Father throughout the Old Testament and all that, now the Spirit's never absent in any of these cases. But if you just want to talk about how much we have, and the focus is the Bible is disproportional. If you want to just talk about volume of words and amount of information, it just is. And so if our speech and understanding is going to follow the same pattern, well, we shouldn't be surprised that it has the same pattern. But that's not going to add up to ne neglect or fear or altogether negative reasons I talked about. No interest, um, don't care about it. <clears throat> um, but biblically, for instance, there is no description of the Spirit's relationship to the Father. It's just not talked about in any direct way. You have them named together. You have this word proceeding in one way. You have them coordinated in some ways, the Spirit being involved when Jesus is involved. But you don't have a description uh, of this. You don't, like in Jesus' prayer where he's praying to the Father, you know, we don't have things like that. So the scripture revelation is, is disproportional uh, in that way. And so, you know, possibly uh, ours should be. Now, of course, you can artificially make it the same by uh, trying to create logical chains of uh, argumentation and speculation about the spirit and starting with scripture and then carrying it away and going on and on about things. And that's where actually a lot of heresy and bad teaching about the spirit comes in. Because some people decided, I'm going to make it even. <laughs> and so you have to make up stuff to fill in the gap. Well, that's not recommended. <laughs> Way to go. Now, behind this, why is there unequal information simply about uh, the Holy Spirit? And it seems to me it fits together because what we do find out about the Spirit is the very nature of the Spirit and the nature of his work makes sense that there is less to say definitively and authoritatively about the Spirit. So, for instance, first, the Spirit is not incarnate. You don't have a revelation of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit doesn't say, well, Jesus, okay, you go off stage. Now, here I am, incarnate the Spirit. It's my turn on the stage. The Holy Spirit doesn't show up on the stage like Jesus does. He's the only one 
that's incarnate. And that's, of course, why we have a lot more to say about him. <laughs> because he was. Of course, that was the whole the purpose. He is the word of God. So the spirit doesn't have his own incarnation. The spirit, as a matter of fact, doesn't have his own independent word. Jesus is the logos, the word of God uh, to us. Um, so even when the spirit is present within creation, he doesn't have his own revelation. It doesn't have his own self-explanation uh, as well. The spirit remains the spirit. That is, remains disembodied, does not have an incarnation. But part of what this does is, by the spirit remaining that way, it prevents us from producing God simply to a creature. Now, some people even think that by the incarnation, the father turned into a man. The creature. So we say, you know, that God became incarnate in Christ. Well, some people get to thinking is that means God turned into a man. And then people go, well, who's running the universe then? Right? Uh, no, it's really the Son of God who is God, the eternal Son of God, then as remaining what he was, assumed a human nature to himself. So he didn't stop being something that he was and then turn into. God. Now that's, it's easier to think that way. You know, A becomes B. It ceases to be A. It's now B. <laughs> well, that's easy to think. It just doesn't apply uh, to the truth about who God is. So he remains what he was, the eternal son of God, and assumes uh, a human nature as well. Uh, well, the, the spirit then uh, never did take on a human nature himself. But if you ask, ah, how was Jesus conceived in the womb of Mary? What's the answer? Spirit. By the Spirit. So you see, there's the answer to the how question. Does it tell you the mechanisms, like how much DNA, you know? Like, what about the chromosomes? You know, what happened there? You don't get that type of explanation. You get the explanation of who, the agent. So I suppose, you know, if the Spirit knows, and if we ask the Spirit, and thought it was important for us to know the spirit could explain well this is what i did <laughs> but we don't it's far more important to know who it occurred by than how but the spirit doesn't provide us that but we do have it's not the absence of the spirit by any means it is by the spirit but god cannot by the spirit remaining the spirit and not becoming incarnate that's where the spirit doesn't turn into a creature ever Okay, even the son didn't exactly turn into a creature, but added creaturely reality to himself. But by saying God is the spirit, and the spirit is God, and he remains, and the Holy Spirit remains the Holy Spirit, prevents us from thinking of God as merely being a creature. Even though that ought to be the case, even when we think of Jesus, because he wasn't merely a creature. He was the eternal son of God who also took on a humanity. Well, another reason, as we see in Scripture, about the nature and the ministry of the Holy Spirit and why there is this disproportion, why do we don't have as much information as much to say. Now, it's equally important. It's not a dis distinction of importance. It's a distinction of how much we can say and how much we can explain, how many words we have and how many verses we can refer to, these kinds of things. Why not? Well, it seems that the whole purpose and the ministry of the Holy Spirit actually has this maddening thing of always directing attention away from himself. So when the Spirit comes upon us, it points us to Jesus and the truth. He will remind you, Jesus says, of everything I've told you. See, the Holy Spirit's is saying, hey, Jesus, you've got, that, you've got the, you know, the microphone now for plenty of time. Now it's my turn to tell people about myself. No, when the Holy Spirit gets the microphone, what does he announce? It helps us recall all that he taught. The truth that he taught. See, isn't that like maddening? But see, the Holy Spirit doesn't really draw attention to himself. He's pointing away from himself. Because why? Well, because that's his ministry is so that we see who Jesus is. The early church put it this way. The Holy Spirit's like light. And the light shines. The Holy Spirit is the light. Shines on the face of Jesus, which is a concrete human face, right? Okay, 
And when the Holy Spirit's light shines on the face of Jesus, what do we see reflected in the face of Jesus? The invisible face of the Father. Isn't that a beautiful thing? But you see, the Holy Spirit doesn't say, hey, look at me, look at me, I'm the light, I'm the light, I'm shining, I'm shining, you see? No, why does the Holy Spirit shine? So that we look in the face of Jesus, we see the face of the Father. See, that's the whole point of the light. The light doesn't draw attention to itself. That doesn't mean it's not important. We wouldn't, because if the light didn't shine, what would happen? We wouldn't see the face of the Father in the face of the Son. In fact, there wouldn't even be a face of the Son incarnate if there wasn't. You see, but the light has a different mission and ministry. And so the Spirit is not drawing attention to itself. So some people have even said is if you add the biblical picture up, the Spirit is the shy one of the Trinity or the retiring one. Uh, or actually, we could even say is the humble one because it serves the Father and the Son. Now, should we know that, that the Holy Spirit serves the Father? Absolutely. would be, be somewhat impoverished if we didn't know that and we only spoke about it. But see, in an odd way, whenever you talk about the Spirit, it ends up referring to one of the others because that's the ministry of the Spirit. The Spirit says, yeah, all right, you saw the face of the Father in the face of the Son. Yay! <laughs> that's what I do. That's why I'm here. Now, of course, even if we repent, what happens? What's the ministry of the Spirit is to bring us conviction of sin. Why does that happen? Why does anybody ever repent and not hang on to their pride and remain in self-justification mode all their existence? Because the Holy Spirit works. But you only see it when someone repents. You don't see the Holy Spirit kind of working behind the scenes. As a matter of fact, most of the work of the Holy Spirit is internal to persons and you don't see the Holy Spirit working. You see the results at the end of the working of the Holy Spirit. You say, aha, look, when that happens, that means the Holy Spirit of God was at work. When we're hearing God speak in his word, when we're seeing the face of the Father in the face of the Son, when we're repenting, when we're grasping the word of God, when we're interpreting scripture as God intended it, you say is, yeah, that's the work of the Spirit. But did you watch the gears turning? Did you see the machinery happening? No, you didn't. You see, you see, it's manifested at the end. So most of the work of the Holy Spirit, as far as I can tell, is invisible to us. What you see is the result, the effect. And the Holy Spirit says, hey, wait a minute. Wait a minute. I did all this so that you could give me praise and notice me. You see, well, the Spirit just really doesn't work that way. The Spirit seems to deliberately not draw attention to himself the shy one, the humble one, the retiring one, or some of you said it this way, the self-effacing one. In other words, doesn't have his own face. But the Spirit's not worried about that. They're giving glory uh, to one another, and the Spirit has his own way of uh, giving glory. And even his own name, notice there's an asymmetry, like, well, father and son. Like, see, that's real concrete. Oh, yeah, yeah, father and son. We know about that. See, so that seems easier to, to think about. It's like, but then kind of like the Spirit, well, that's not, gee, gosh, the Holy Spirit got shortchanged once again. <laughs> I mean, what Spirit? You know, I can't like Father, Son, okay. I, I know what that is, or do we? But we think we do. It sounds more familiar. But the Holy Spirit, oh, I guess shortchanged. But you see, maybe that's how it's supposed to be. Maybe that's not a mistake. Maybe even the name, the Holy Spirit, is to prevent us from trying to kind of like nail this down in the same way. There's an asymmetry. It doesn't, it doesn't all just exactly the same. Because they're different in person and different in the ministries uh, they lead. And finally, though, the Spirit doesn't have his own independent ministry. Because what the Spirit does in us, to summarize it, is the Holy Spirit delivers to us all the benefits of the work of Christ. All the benefits of the work of Christ. 
So he doesn't say as well, Jesus, you did that awesome thing on the cross. Well, that's nice. That was your turn. And I hope everybody praises you an awful lot for that. But, you know, I'm going to go off and do my own thing because I got my own ministry here. And after all, I got to raise my own funds. <laughs> you know, I got to have my own name in the lights over here. You see? Yeah. And so, you no, know, the Holy Spirit delivers to us. Delivers to us. And a simple way to say it is what Christ has done for us. The Holy Spirit does in us. That's about the simplest way you can kind of put it. All of what Christ has done for us, the Holy Spirit works out in us. Now, is that nothing? See, from the Holy Spirit's point of view, that's everything. We're one God. We're the Savior God. The Father sends the Son. The Son sends the Spirit. All what? So that we might have the life of God in us. And where was that life worked out in a way that can fit us but in the Son, in his perfect humanity? So the whole, I don't think the Holy Spirit is being left out here. I need my own ministry apart from the Son, you know. They're one in being. They're one in act. They're one in mind, one in heart. The whole God is the Savior God, Father, Son, and Spirit. And the Spirit leads in working out in us what Christ has accomplished for us in his humanity. That's a marvel. So the Spirit does work in us in ways. Of course, this is why Jesus says it's an advantage that another comforter come to you, right, to, to deliver to you and within you and to have my life in you so that we are indwelt by the Spirit. But that Spirit is the Spirit of Jesus who has accomplished everything for us. So you see, sometimes if you want to give the Spirit equal time, so you could, you could say, as well, Jesus did this, but the Spirit does that, as if it's independent. There is no independence. They are working entirely uh, together. And so that actually ought to kind of guide our, our thinking and our explanations and our preaching and teaching about the nature of the Spirit, is they ought to mutually refer to one another. Because the Spirit's the Spirit of the Son and the Spirit of the Father. That's who the Spirit is. And the working of the Spirit is to work out in us what the Son has done uh, for us. And that's an incredible uh, thing. And so there are manifestations of the working of the Spirit as that leading edge. Um, and that relationship is very dynamic and variable and not static or fixed or mechanical, but personal and relational. And you can see this at Pentecost, for instance, when the Spirit comes down. Nobody's controlling that. Nobody's planned for it. Um, but it is time because Christ had finished, as it were, his work in his earthly form. And so now the Spirit that noticed Jesus promises. The Spirit is the one promised by the Son. And, of course, the Spirit shows up. And they start talking about the great and mighty things that God has done. And they are able to relate to each other in amazing ways as the Spirit is working now in them in new ways. And so we have manifestations that are dynamic, variable, not static, not fixed, not mechanical, but personal and relational. You can also see this in Paul's admonitions to not quench the Spirit or not grieve the Spirit. That means there's a dynamic relationship. It's not just the switch is on. Oh, in the spirit, oh, the switch is off. Uh, the spirit's completely absent and a billion miles away, having nothing to do with anything. It actually doesn't work like that. There is a dynamic. So this continually be being filled is actually a good way to, to translate one of the places where Paul talks about be being filled. It's actually a relationship. See, it's not, it's not a vending machine. <laughs> you know, put in the right coins, push the right button and, you know, get your soda <laughs> or your candy bar or something or other. It's really not on and off. It's not a mechanical relationship. It is dynamic. Well, it's kind of like the wind <laughs> blowing. But it does blow. But, yeah, it's not a mechanical thing. It's dynamic. So be being filled with, with the Spirit. And then there's also the working of the Spirit in terms of the gifts of the Spirit as well. These are dynamic. 
So the person with liberality, let him give with liberality. But it's easier to think in mechanical terms, isn't it? Just on, off. It's easy to think that. <laughs> you know, one place or that. Yes, no. Except God's not like that. <laughs> and it's, I suppose we could say maybe even especially the Spirit's not like that. There is a dynamic living spirit. The spirit is living and moving, acting as an agent, interacting with us in a deep and personal way. And I would say is in a lot of ways we aren't even aware of. By the time we become aware of it, the spirit's probably already moved on to another thing. <laughs> and we kind of go, yay, the spirit was working. <laughs> and the spirit's moving on as well. So there is a variability, a change, a dynamic, an ebb and flow to the activity and manifestation and interaction of the Spirit in relationship to the church and in relationship to the world. Um, so then try not to think of the Holy Spirit as a machine, as a vending machine. Or, or even more so, another way is you can think of the, the Spirit as a kind of uh, a genie, you know, a, a, or a magician, as if you, you know, rub the lamp three times and say just the right words, and then, you know, the power of the genie happens. But that's actually a very mechanical kind of thing and actually where we're in charge. We hold the key uh, this time. But you can find teaching like this as if the Holy Spirit is an impersonal power like a genie. Like, you know, if you rub the lamp just the right number of times and say just the right syllables, does the genie have any control over whether he has to come out and grant you your wishes? No. <laughs> If you say it just right. Of course, if you get it slightly wrong, you know, if you say abricadabro, forget it. The genie's not going to come out. But if you say it just right, the genie doesn't have it. But see, we can get these kind of mechanical ideas, and this has the idea of uh, this, the spirit as a mechanical just power. You know, I mean, does electricity have any, any choice when you, you know, plug your iPhone in? You know, it's like... No, the electricity comes out. It doesn't say, no, not, not for your iPhone. It's just a mechanical power. But see, we can think about the spirit as an impersonal power rather than a very personal God. And so the two words I like to use to emphasize this about the spirit and applies equally to the Father and the Son is uh, sovereign. Okay, so what characterized the working in the Spirit towards us is what we're talking about now as a Father. Sovereign grace. Now, uh, sovereign means is that he works as he wills. This is, we're talking about God. <laughs> and we're talking about the personal God, just as personal as the Father and the Son. Not less personal, not just, right, an abstract machine or magic or electricity or an impersonal force. The, you know, the Holy Spirit is an agent, a personal agent, has a will, we could say is, has a brain. <laughs> um, all right, this is the sovereign God acting as the Spirit. And so you can't forget the sovereignty of God and start thinking about that we're controlling the levers of the Holy Spirit under our control, like a vending machine would, or electricity, or even a magician or a genie. See, that's, that's denying the sovereignty. That's making me sovereign over an impersonal power. Or I want to know, how can I get control of this power? Well, you know what? That whole understanding, and some of you know this from the book of Acts, do you remember Simon the sorcerer? He became a convert, but what did he want to do? As soon as he found out about this awesome power of the Holy Spirit, he wanted to purchase it from Peter buy it so what you see he was formerly a magician you see what happened is his mind hadn't been sanctified yet he didn't know the nature and character of this holy spirit he thought like wow power and if i can control it like i did as a magician you see he's still thinking like a magician that he had techniques you see or secret words or or you know uh, gestures or whatever he had in order to try to control power. So he thinks, wow, power over there. Okay, so I don't want that power anymore.
bad power, bad power. And so now he's going to go over to the Holy Spirit, but he's going to approach the Holy Spirit in the same way. See? So his mind had not yet been converted. Well, he got some pretty strong words there. He was repudiated in the strongest of words and told to repent immediately about this because the God's power cannot be used or controlled. And this is one of the first heresies, actually, in the New Testament, besides denying the divinity of Jesus or he was raised from the dead. And this, is, this actually has a name now called Simon. And that means it's the desire to control the Holy Spirit as if it's an impersonal power and not sovereign, not free from us to blow where it wills. But it's easy to do that. You see, the Spirit sounds abstract. It can sound impersonal, except when you realize, oh, this is the Spirit of the Father and the Son, and that doesn't sound so impersonal. And He's one in being. You see, so there's nothing impersonal about the power of the Spirit. It's, in some ways, the most personal <laughs> power of the Spirit and the most uh, sovereign, working not only around us, but in us and through us. So uh, avoiding kind of the problem of simony, thinking that you can use the Holy Spirit, even for good. I mean, Simon Magnus didn't want to use it for evil things. He saw the, the apostles healing people, and he said, I want that power. You see, well, that wasn't particularly bad to want to serve in those ways, but his desire to possess and control, manipulate, or to think that he needed to, uh, was completely off. Because what? It misrepresents the nature and the character of the Holy Spirit. Who is at work at the apostles? And you see, the apostles knew they didn't buy the power of the Spirit. They knew they had a whole different kind of relationship with the Holy Spirit then I think it was shocking, Walton, when he comes up to them and he says, hey, can I, can, I, can I buy some of that too? I think they're like, whoa, wait a minute, what's, that, what's happened? Oh, no, we don't have that kind of relationship with the Holy Spirit at all. It's not like the relationship of a magician to magical power in any way, sense, or form. This is a huge lesson right at the very beginning that God taught the, the early church. And for us to hang on to that is really important. But in some ways, it's just remembering who the Holy Spirit is in relationship to the Father and the Son. So he's sovereign, not under our control, and also gracious. And what that means is the reason to bring that out, the gracious part, is it's because the Holy Spirit doesn't need to be cajoled into working. It doesn't need to be persuaded. It doesn't mean to be manipulated. You don't have to kind of, uh, you know, he's not locked up and wishes he could get out. You know, and up to us is the grace is he's graciously moving before we even ask or think of it. This is the sovereign grace of God. The, the Holy Spirit is just as gracious as the Son and the Father is. All right, so there's no difference. The Spirit works graciously. So this means you don't have to condition or cajole or somehow persuade the Holy Spirit or put the Spirit in a corner or somehow kind of unlock the spirit because he's in some kind of prison, uh, or the spirit needs something or other uh, from us or he can't work. That was to be to make the grace of the working of the spirit conditional upon us. Well then actually it isn't grace anymore. See, you can oddly enough, you don't only have to be legalistic about the father or the Sabbath, <laughs> or salvation, getting to heaven, you can be legalistic about the Spirit. It would seem odd, but <laughs> see, you can say that the Spirit, the grace of the Spirit is conditioned upon us, dependent upon us. It's just as easy in some ways. That's the, the magician's view of the magic is just like that. The genie says, "Is hey, you know, three swipes from right to left. That's it. <laughs> see, that's a kind of legalism that puts it back on us. Okay, but the gracious work of the Holy Spirit is a continuation of the gracious working of the Father and the Son. So the Spirit works graciously. Yeah, we can participate or not. 
Okay, so yes, there are ways for us to participate in our understanding um, and our recognition and our just surely response to saying is, wow, that was the work of the Holy Spirit. That is incredible. Praise God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Yes, indeed. That is a marvel. But it's a marvel of sovereign grace. And so we can participate more fully, be filled with the Spirit. Or you can resist it or avoid it. <laughs> um, and all that. But it is a gracious work, just like the gracious work of Christ. So it's no less gracious. So we shouldn't think about participating in the, in the life of the Spirit in any other way as if it's not sovereign grace and uh, the, the uh, grace that comes from God's sovereignty. It's freely given. But yes, we are called to participate, be filled with the Spirit. Um, so, but we're not conditioning the, the working of the Spirit. We're not earning it. We're not, especially the word channeling it. <laughs> Uh, we're not manipulating it, controlling it, or determining the working or manifestation uh, uh, of the Spirit. So I think that's another thing to kind of uh, remember, this gracious sovereignty, and that will prevent us from this simony, from flipping over into that. But, you know, we like techniques, and we like to make God predictable. And a lot of times we're in, when we're in big trouble, we want to make sure God does X in this situation. So we like to see if there isn't some kind of technique or some kind of formula or some kind of pattern or something where essentially we hold the key. And we're constantly tempted into that. We all are at times, especially in times of desperation. And so we want, well, God to be more like a, uh, you know, magic and impersonal power. Uh, we don't like the sovereignty of God sometimes because it doesn't match my will <laughs> or my speed and all that. I've been there. We've all been there. It's, we're sorely tempted. Being like Simon Magnus at certain moments in our lives where I just want to know the formula, God, because something needs to happen here and you're not doing it. And so you can, the evil one will say is, yeah, and you know why? It's because it's up to you and you're missing it. If only you knew the formula, if only you were holy enough, if only you were sincere enough, if only your expectations were high enough, if only your community, if only you read the Bible, if only, if only, if only, if only. Of course, every if only mentioned there says grace isn't grace. It throws us back on ourselves. You see, so to recognize the working of the Spirit is of the exact same character as the saving work of Christ. And so, yes, there are ways to participate with what the Spirit is doing, but the Spirit will never relinquish his sovereignty or never cease to be gracious and somehow become conditional and legal in a legal relationship with us. But we can be tempted, and certain teachings tend to go in this way. Well, there are a number of implications. I'm just going to take a few minutes, and then we'll go into question and answer for 15 or uh, so minutes um, here. So let me mention kind of our participation in this gracious ministry of the Holy Spirit. What it seems to me um, comes out of this as we uh, focus on it. And the first thing... is that the, the primary ministry is the one of transforming us, sanctifying us, and enabling us to share in that new nature, Christ, if we're so the primary is his work in us. So the transforming work in us. Now this, another problem can come is when you start separating the fruit of the Spirit from the gifts of the Spirit, or usually it's often the other way around, separating the gifts of the Spirit from the fruit of the Spirit. See, that's a huge mistake, because now we're splitting up the ministry of the Spirit into its parts. But the primary work is to deliver all the benefits of Christ to us, in us, and that yields in the fruit of the Spirit. And that yields, then, in the gifts of the Spirit. But the Spirit is not saying as well, 
you know, I, I'm into one or the other, but sometimes teachings or emphases can get at. But if we realize the connection between the Spirit and Jesus, then we'll see when we talk about Christ's likeness, we're talking about the fruit of the Spirit, aren't we? Because guess what? Jesus lived by the Spirit <laughs> as one of us. And so in his life, we have the fruit of the Spirit. So we don't, we want to see connected all the time the fruit and the gifts, never disconnected, and saying, really, there is a way in which the fruit is primary. The fruit is the primary. Now, Paul indicates this when love is the primary thing, when he's talking about the gifts. And what has been wrong is they went off with the gifts without the love. And guess what? Wrecked havoc. You see? So if we're talking about the spirit, you cannot be uh, separate uh, the fruit uh, from the gifts. So... So the fruit is building in kind of like who we are. The gifts are the manifestations of who we are and who we're becoming in Christ, uh, filled with his likeness or his sanctification. So oddly enough, the Holy Spirit doesn't give us his own sanctification. He gives us Christ's sanctification, which is has a human form. The Holy Spirit's holiness wouldn't fit us as human beings. We would just explode. <laughs> And so the, the, the sanctification that Christ has worked out, God has worked for us in Christ, is what the Holy Spirit shares with us. So that's why as the Holy Spirit works, we become like Christ, which is the fruit of the Spirit. And so the, the, the primary manifest, center of that uh, fruit then really is love, and we could describe. So when the Spirit is working, what should we expect? Uh, love, and that love will be a desire for unity and peace and harmony, Paul emphasizes. So unity, peace, and harmony among the, the members. That's how it's going to show up. So any working of the gifts are going to be actually extensions of just ways of loving. If the gifts are not ways of loving, then they're not gifts of the spirit. So test the spirits. Um, and also, because of its, its unity and all that, we wouldn't expect that the movement of the spirit wouldn't set up some kind of hierarchy of super spiritual and less spiritual. And it wouldn't foster envy and jealousy. Oh, they're more spiritual than we are. Or their fellowship is more spiritual. Or I'm less spiritual than they are. That's not where the spirit's going to take us. That's not what the spirit's about. You know, well, my gift's more important than yours. Or my gift is less important than yours. You see, now, the, now the, the fruit and the gifts are falling apart. <laughs> Rather than, no, the Spirit's bringing them together. They can never come apart because the Spirit is one in his ministry and in his uh, person. So it, the Spirit will not foster competitiveness where I'm trying to beat you and be more superior and more spiritual than you are. That was what was going on in the church in Corinth. Also, this, the, those, here's another, it's maybe a little bit more subtle, but just as important as the Spirit is fostering the fruit and love and unity and harmony of the different parts, is the Spirit will not insist on its own way, even if that way is freedom. Like, I've got my freedom in Christ. This is what was going on in Corinth, right? I've got my freedom in Christ, so I don't care about you. Oh, wait a minute, is that going to come from the Spirit? I don't care about you. I'm going to do my own thing because I'm free in Christ. Too bad for you. You can't handle it. Tough. No, it doesn't insist on its own way. Why? Because the gifts are never exercised apart from the fruit. So there's always going to be this concern if it's coming from the Spirit and never splitting apart. So it doesn't insist on its own way, even if it's in freedom. And so Paul says, yeah, I'm free in Christ, but I don't exercise all my freedoms. Why? For the sake of the body. So you just you can't just uh, go off um, without a concern uh, for others, members of the body. I don't think, this might get more controversial, that the ministry of the Spirit is to give us primarily an experience of the Spirit itself. Like, I want an experience of the Spirit. Um, 
I don't think the working in the ministry of the Spirit is giving us experiences, but it actually enabling us to serve and to build up, to help and to assist and to deepen the quality of relationships within the church, in reach, and its ministry and outreach uh, and service to, uh, to others. So yes, you will have an experience, but you won't say as, yippee, I had an experience of the Spirit. Now I just want another one for myself. <laughs> we will have experiences of the Spirit, but they're going to be experience of love and service and fellowship and joy and worship. But you're going to be more concerned about who you're worshiping. Not, I had an experience. I had another experience. And, oh, you had an experience. I wish I had that experience. I want that experience. How could you get that experience and I didn't have that experience? Wow, God must not like me. Or God must like me because... I mean, I won't say this out loud, but I must be superior because I had an experience. I don't think the this, this Spirit wants us to have, yay, I had an experience of the Spirit. It's like, wow, the fruit of the Spirit's in my life. How did that happen? It must be the work of the Spirit. It's like, wow, I actually tried to serve somebody, and they benefited in amazing ways that gave glory to God. How did that happen? must have been by the Spirit. Wow. Do I want to live in the middle of that? <laughs> you see, the object isn't the Spirit itself or just some kind of experience, like a spiritual high. I just want to get high on Jesus. So I was a part of the charismatic movement in the 70s, and everybody was wanting to get, you know, okay, I'm not getting high on, you know, this, that, and the other, but I want to get high on the Spirit. And that's basically all that happened. And usually the rest of their lives were kind of a wreck. But, yeah, you know, every, every couple days a week, and a worship service, they were high on Jesus. But it wasn't having, there was no fruit and there was no service. But they were having experiences of the Spirit. But it wasn't leading anywhere. And I, well, wait a minute. If this is who the Spirit is, yeah, for some of them, they moved on. But some people didn't seem to. They seemed stuck getting high on Jesus. And then they went back sometimes later to get high on other things, too. Because why not? One high is just as good as another, isn't it? <laughs> Um, and that's what they, they may have been escaping their problems and this and that. These, these are complicated situations. Um, but the working of the Spirit will enable us to respond more fully and freely to the truth and reality of God and the gospel. So the response, yes, the Holy Spirit enables us to respond fully with all that we are. Well, God, that's what the Spirit is up to. So yes, that, the Spirit does free us to uh, respond in every level. But see, in every level, sometimes I think we think the Holy Spirit only enables us to respond emotionally. Well, of course, we're human beings, so yes, that's going to be a part of it, absolutely. But the Holy Spirit enables us to respond with our minds. This is the spirit of truth. So it's going to enable us to respond with all of what we are. So, so there's no reason to think that the Holy Spirit, see, sometimes it gets divided up this way. Jesus messes with our minds, and the Holy Spirit messes with our emotions. It's like, no, the whole ministry of Jesus is being a full human being. He's responding fully with all that he is to God, and he does so in the Spirit. So when the Spirit of Jesus comes upon us, it enables us to respond fully. So, yes, if there's part of us we're not yet responding, the Holy Spirit will bring that out. But the Holy Spirit doesn't divide up. So often we think the Holy Spirit is subjective, internal, affective, you see, you know, the Holy Spirit works in us, in our subjectivity, but he works in us so that we can respond with our whole being to God. The Holy Spirit is a healer that brings the whole of the human being together, not splits it up and saying, well, you know, I'm just in charge of this part of making you sanctified and whole and all that. And I guess Jesus takes care of that part. I don't know. <laughs> the Holy Spirit does not divide up the human being but actually makes it whole so that it all works together. So that the heart serves. We're always talking about the division between the mind and the heart. You see, what you think is, well, the Holy Spirit just deals with the heart and somebody else deals with the mind. The Holy Spirit is going to say is, man, we've got to get this thing together. The heart and the mind need to be working together here. That's what it means to be a whole human being. So the Holy Spirit is not going to divide people up. So, and another correlation to this, I think I'll bring it to a close on this, is that the Holy Spirit then makes us more fully human like Jesus. It humanizes us. So that may bring a humility, but not a humiliation. It will not make us feel less than human. 
So I know this cuts against the grain of some teaching I've heard. Yes, the Holy Spirit of sharing with us the sanctity of Jesus is to make us fully human, more human, more personal, more full of the fruit of the Spirit. So the Spirit does not dehumanize us or depersonalize us, even if it brings a humility, but humility is a deep personal and human thing. But being humiliated is something less than a person. It's a whole different deal. And you notice Jesus never did that in his whole ministry. And that's not what happened to him. He has a wholeness and fullness of his humanity. So the Holy Spirit humanizes us. So to be fully spiritual is not to become non-human or super spiritual or disembodied. See, sometimes you can get that idea of spirituality. Spirit, true spirituality is a human being fully responded to the truth of who God is. Firing on every cylinder, responding totally to who we are. Yes, in praise and prayer and in every other way of service and love. So the Holy Spirit is the humanizing spirit, sharing with us the very perfect humanity of Jesus. Well, those are some implications. That will get me in plenty of trouble already so all right well that is a lot of stuff for the spirit that you can't say very much about <laughs> but all right so we'll take yes thank you Gary that was, that was uh, a lot like you said so hopefully you won't be in too much trouble but uh, the, the sense of um, Pastor Kruger had written about the form of spirit in the Old Testament Yeah, I know some have said that, and God is God is God of male and female, right. and all that. God is God is neither male or female, but when He creates, He can create male and female. So, uh, is that? But no, grammar doesn't have anything to do with the nature of That's being. Right. And so, of course, well, you all ought to know this, like German speakers here, and all that. Grammatical gender doesn't have anything to do with the biological nature of the things talked about. And they don't match up across languages. In one language, a mountain is feminine. In another language, a mountain is masculine. Right. They don't match up. In the New Testament, pneuma is actually neuter. So should we call the Holy Spirit an it? No. You see, the grammar has actually no decisive issue here. Now, it may have something to do with the way we, we formulate our grammar. But God is the fullness of masculinity and femininity and even more. Yeah, so no, the grammar is in, the insignificant. Though, the experience when I hear the voice of the Holy Spirit it sounds a whole lot like my wife. How does that work? <laughs> <laughs> that's right, but sometimes it'll probably sound like your father, though, too. Yeah, that's right. That's a whole other thing. Yeah, that's right. Oh, God is the, the fullness. So, I mean, Paul can talk about himself as a nursemaid. As if, as if he's breastfeeding the people of God. Like, whoa! It, yeah, he doesn't have trouble with that. So God is a fullness of that. But yeah, you can't... To say the Holy Spirit is feminine is really to project biological and creaturely understandings on God. God is not a biological being and therefore doesn't have gender. That's one of the reasons in the Old Testament, out of all the Canaanite gods... Every male god had a female god. They all had their consorts. All right? They were sexual beings. Uh, but the weird thing about the god of Israel is this god didn't have a consort. And that was weird religion. <laughs> you see? Um, and so that's what set Israel off because the god of Israel was not a sexual being. Yep. All right. That was easy by comparison. All right. Yes. <laughs> Colin Gillette. Thank you. Uh, it's a very important subject to some of us. Yes. Areas where uh, charismatic, charismatic movement is really taking place. Um, you mentioned that the Holy Spirit does not have his own 
Independent ministry. Mm -hmm. Sure. Well, which, if you want to ask, is which of these gifts doesn't show up in the life of Jesus? They're all there in some form or another. So when the Spirit is working, what he's doing is, is the life of Jesus showing up in these various ways. Was Jesus, you know, liberal in his giving? You see, yes. Was he healing? Was he this? You can see that everyone, so that we are, the Holy Spirit is enabling the ministry of Jesus to now manifest itself. Now, not, and because it's not even, because we're not Jesus, all right? So, yes, some is going to show up here or there in others. There's going to be a greater manifestation of one at one time or another. I don't think the gifts are actually fixed that necessarily the offices might be, but I think the gifts I don't think are necessarily permanent. This person always has this gift. See, that's more like the mechanical on, off, you know, I've got it, I possess it, well, now they possess it, uh, this type of thing. So I think you'll see that this, these are, yes, a, a, a dynamic manifestation of the continuing ministry of Jesus that has the same characteristics that you see in him. Both the fruit, like which of these fruit does not Jesus have, right? Same thing. Now, which of these ministries does not show up? In Jesus. So the Spirit is enabling to participate in Jesus' ministry. Kathy, you did a lot of study on this recently. Um, well, yeah. I mean, just before that part, it says there are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit, different kinds of service, but the same Lord, different kinds of working or energies, but the same God, Father. And then he uses that same exact word later when he's talking about the Spirit. So it's the Trinitarian, like before that. Right, so he's talking about the oneness of God working together. So there's a unity in God. So guess what? When the Spirit works, there's going to be a unity among us. Because God's not divided. We're not going to be divided. And the Spirit's certainly not going to be involved in dividing us, but uniting us. So one Lord, one, yes. Is it all right to say that the Holy Spirit would have the lead in the orchestration of the gifts? Oh, yeah, because he's working, see, in us so that it manifests out of us. See, the Spirit is building in the life of Jesus. And of course, he builds it in. Guess what? It shows forth uh, in us. So, right. So you have these various manifestations, but there ought to be kind of a unity of, well, of spirit. Does that, I don't know, does that blow away some of this? Yeah. So I think this is how we test the spirit. If, it's, if it sounds like, see, Jesus, then it's the Holy Spirit. If it doesn't. And right before that, Lord, by, the by the Spirit. So when they're thinking they're so spiritual, the first thing he says is, well, to know somebody spiritual is that they know the Lordship of Christ. And then he goes on. Yeah. That's why he has so the, the Spirit's Christ. already locked us into the Lordship of Christ. Yeah. Yes. Wendy. Right, which means name, right. The name is the name of a relationship. Right, it's, mm -hmm. it's a name. It's not that they have um, different jobs that they do. It's just they may be separating it out. Like well, they're not independent jobs, so they're always working together, even if one's taking the lead here and then the other's taking the lead. But they're all working together and harmonized, so they're not independent. Um, and their workings don't isn't what makes them distinct. What makes them distinct is the Spirit's the Spirit and has a unique relationship with the Father and Son. That's why the Spirit's different from all eternity. 
But they can have these different leads, but that's not what makes them distinct. You see, if Jesus wasn't incarnate, would he still be the Son of God? See, his incarnation in our redemption doesn't make him distinct from the Father and the Son, but because he is distinct, the Son can be incarnate and not the Father and the Spirit. He is distinct. But that's not what makes him distinct. From all eternity, he would have been the Son, whether he was incarnate or not, or whether the Father created or not. All right? So God is who he is, independent of creation. And that when we mean the Trinity, that's what we mean, is who is God, independent of creation, because God's not dependent upon creation to be who he is. So that means the Father, Son, and Spirit aren't dependent upon us. But creation, notice, that's a relationship between us and creation and sanctification and salvation. Those are all relationships of God to that which is external and not God. So God can do it, and God can take one person can take the lead, but that's not what makes the Father, Son, and Spirit distinct from one another as the divine persons. They are a fellowship and relationship from all eternity before there is a creation or anything to do. Yeah, it's tough. <laughs> yeah. That's right. Yes, that's right. And, and it's relationship to us, right? Right. But leads right in connection with the Father and the Spirit. All harmonize. Yep. All right. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to force the Holy Spirit to do the work that I the Holy Spirit. Yeah, it gets very tricky because it's easy to start focusing back on us. Now, the thing is to always build a platform and then put whatever we're going to talk about ourselves on that platform. So as long as you build the platform about who God is and what God's up to, and then it's always about our participating or joining in, then you can talk about that, but it's, we're going to join in by the grace of God and by the operation of the Spirit and by the sovereign work of God. So, you know, it's always tricky, and you always have to kind of, you always have to kind of throw something out and then kind of go back and fix it <laughs> because it can go off and people can get the wrong idea. And right, this is the kind of thing, missional church, all this kind of stuff that we're talking about ourselves, you think God said, is, all right, you guys go be a missional church. Try real hard now, right? I mean, all that, anytime we start talking about ourselves or our experience or what we can all go wrong. So you have to kind of like rebuild that foundation about who God is all the time. That's why all our ministry has to be, that's what we mean by being theological. It all has to be recognizing, oh, wait a minute, <laughs> which God are we talking about? Who is this God and what's this God doing? And now it's all about how we are getting involved by the grace of God. Yeah. So you always have to correct. <laughs> No. Right. No. I know there's no more questions. Oh, well, uh, yeah, James. Yeah, I'm, it is a little bit complicated, 
but part of it is if the ministry of the Holy Spirit is to point us to the Father through the Son, then eventually the Spirit's going to get around to that no matter where it is. So, uh, sure, this, the Spirit is at work in all kinds of ways that we aren't able to be involved because we're not the Spirit. So you can see this like in, in Philip's ministry and the Ethiopian, the guy out in the chariot, right? Philip has no idea who this Ethiopian reading Isaiah is, but the Spirit does. So the Spirit gets him there somehow uh, and all. But what does it do? He's reading Isaiah. And, and of course, uh, then Philip then points him to this fulfillment in Jesus. So the Spirit is always going to eventually, yes, start where people are, but get them to where he's going. So when we show up, sooner or later, we're going to ask, and the test will finally be is, okay, is the spirit involved in this way and that way among this, in this person or in this group and all that? The, the test is finally going to come around to the point is, will they say this Jesus is Lord? Now, if they don't, then guess what? We've misunderstood that the spirit wasn't working or that they were resisting the spirit or something like that. But the real concrete test is, has Jesus come? And, and Paul tells us, right? This. So, but is that the only thing the Spirit's going to show up and say, this is the first thing, this is the only thing I have to say, I'm not going to say anything or do anything or remind you of anything else. It's just like, is Jesus Lord or not? If you say, yes, I'm here. If, I, if you say, no, I'm gone. See, that's the on switch, on switch, off kind of thing. So the Spirit will come and will prepare people. And of course, there's plenty of missionary stories like this. But... What the Spirit wants them to do is to know God through Christ. The Spirit will eventually bring them to that point. And often human beings get involved as the Spirit is prepared to people is that when they hear the gospel of the Father and the Son that the Spirit is prepared to do, they say is they accept it. They accept it as the gospel. So I put it this way is when the Spirit of God is working, he's always both doing two things in any culture and in any person. He's always fulfilling certain hopes and dreams that God has put there for like for God's grace, for God's love, for God's forgiveness, for hope for the future, these types of things. God is always fulfilling, but he's always offending. So there won't be any culture or any individual where their pride won't be absolutely slayed. So the spirit will always fulfill and offend both. See, so you have some groups who's always going to fulfill. You see, well, that's like, yes, some of those dreams that they have, God actually has placed in their right eternity in their hearts from Ecclesiastes. All right. But there's always going to be something about that that is also going to offend their pride terribly. They're going to have to die to themselves and be raised to Christ. So, but there are others who, yeah, that when the gospel comes or the spirit works, it's always going to offend totally, completely, absolutely. See, it's both. See, this is why it's a sweet-smelling savor to those who are being saved, and it's the stench of death to those who are resisting. But it's actually the ministry is, is both. So we both repent and believe. Repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. Is that fulfilling or offending? It's both. It's both. So it's kind of the, the debate has got us locked into you see, kind of contrasting and incompatible things. But eventually when the Spirit comes, the Spirit will lead people to faith in God through Christ by the Spirit because that's the ministry of the, the Spirit. So to think that they're, the Spirit always wants anonymous Christians, you know, they're, they're Christians or they're saved or something or other, but they don't know the Father and the Son. Well, that's, the Spirit's just not going to go that way. <laughs> um, people may start there. You know, and the Spirit may prepare people. And so, I mean, there's, well, I can do a longer story, but the, uh, uh, the, the tribe in Ira and Jaira and the, um, uh, what's the, the peace child whole thing is a great instance of that, is that they had a peace child, you know, um, myth or story or uh, in their own, in their own tribe. And so the missionaries came and discovered us. They explained Jesus in terms of the peace child. They seemed to draw it near uh, to the gospel. And eventually the tribe did, uh, was converted. But you see, 
are they really going to hang on to their notion of the peace child and say, yes, Jesus is one like that? So we can add them to our pantheon of who we also, yeah, Jesus too, our peace child, that's the real thing. Jesus, you can come on in because you're kind of like that. Are they going to believe in Jesus because they believe primarily in their, in their peace child? Or are they going to really turn it around and their real conversion would be is, Wow, isn't that amazing? God gave us this little picture that's kind of like Jesus, this peace child thing that we had going. But isn't it amazing that the reality is Jesus, God's peace child? See, which is the mirror image and which is the reality? And in the conversion, it's not going to be, is, isn't that great? God appreciated and approved of our notion of peace child that we had forever. Aren't we a great people? that we had this there and we were prepared to receive God. You see, that's two different orientations. And that tribe had to go through a transition, whereas they believed in their peace child because they believed in Christ, not they believed in Christ because they believed in their own peace child. Do you see the difference? And furthermore, they had to stop believing that Judas was the hero of the gospel. That was actually the first thing that happened because they believed in treachery. And they thought... Judas was the hero of the Gospels. Now, how do they, you see, that, so that, in their culture, they had to completely die, totally. And, of course, they had actually done this to people. They had, they, had uh, they call it fattened up, members of a neighboring tribe for years, all the while, for years and years and years, planning the murderous torture and death of one of these tribes members, but they made friends with them for years and years, bringing them to building up trust, building up all this kind of stuff, planning this tremendous betrayal, and they pulled it off. Then these Christian missionaries come up. Well, are, did Jesus fulfill that part of their cultural value, the treachery of, of uh, Judas? You see, no, they had to absolutely repent of that. So I think it's a perfect example. But often this is not brought out You know, in these missionary stories. is just find something that's similar, and that shows you the spirits at work. Well, no, there's a lot more going on. Well, that's a long question, but it is a complicated one. Well, we should probably bring this to a close. But I'm, I'll be around, and I'm happy to talk with you more about the things. I know it's just uh, starting up. Well, let me pray. Lord, you are sovereign, you are spirit, you are among us. We praise you and thank you for all that you are and all that you have done and continue to do among us and among the people we serve and among the people we don't even know about. And so sanctify all this to us that you might build us up, equip us, enable us, enable us to respond with all that we are and all that we have to all of who you are and all that you have done for us in Christ. Amen. Thanks, Gary. Sure.